and it's all you, Don. All right. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate it. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be talking to you guys about a various menagerie of beetles. Um, and the way I kind of classify them is, are they friendly, are they our foe, or can we ignore them? So that's one of the things we're going to be kind of covering as we go through this. We're going to maybe talk about the pests, their habits, uh, treatment options, and, you know, basically what, where they really fall into the category of pest. So the very first one I'm going to start with is the tortoise beetle and the eucalyptus longhorn beetle on our eucalyptus trees. So if you guys have heard me speak ever before, you know I'm a big fan of our eucalyptus trees out here on the west and trying to preserve them. And we have a lot of pests that are now attacking them. Two of the main culprits are the tortoise beetle, and the one that tends to be a tree killer is the eucalyptus longhorn beetle. We have a couple other pests that tend to infest our eucalyptus trees. We have the bronzing bug and the lerpsilid. However, those are more of our sucking piercing pests and not really the focus of the presentation. But I put them up there anyway since we tend to see them a lot. So the reason why I talk about the tortoise beetle first is because this is one we had talked about initially as more of a nuisance pest. Uh, we didn't say it killed the tree, so we kind of ignored it. So we put it on the ignore list. Well, un unfortunately, we've now realized that the way this a pest attacks by chewing those notches out of the leaves, after so many notches have been chewed out of the leaf, the tree actually aborts the leaf and therefore causes this defoliation effect which as we know, defoliation stresses a tree because then they try and push new growth. Uh, so they're definitely a tree stressor. And if we allow their populations to grow out of control, then yes, they can actually lead to tree death. Not necessarily directly, but what ends up happening is then comes in the eucalyptus longhorn borer. And these beetles can definitely kill a eucalyptus tree. They bore into the main trunk of the tree, create very large and extensive galleries, and basically can girdle and kill the tree. So a lot of times we'll see the sucking piercing pests first, the lerpsilla or the bronzing bug, and then we'll tend to see the tortoise beetle come in, and then usually the final nail in the coffin for the tree will be the eucalyptus longhorn borer. The really nice thing about all of these pests on the eucalyptus trees is that it's only one chemical that you really need to treat them, and it's imidacloprid. Imidacloprid will take care of all four of these pests. So usually one application, and you've usually protected the tree for a year. I tend to recommend doing applications in fall, and that's just because our eucalyptus trees like to flower in spring. And on the imidacloprid labels, we have the B box labels, the ones specifying cannot, applications cannot be done when the tree is in flower. Uh, so keep that in mind. That's why I tend to say do it in fall. Trees usually are not flowering at that point in time. And so it's safe to do your applications. And you can do the uh, imidacloprid application via trunk injection technology, or you can do it with a soil drench. Either way, it usually lasts about a year um, and so you may have to come in if you have a really high infestation for a few years to actually get full control of the pests and protect the tree. So this one we now classify no longer as an ignore. This is actually on the needs to treat list, uh, especially uh, with the number of eucalyptus trees we have in our urban canopy and how much they can cause uh, issues when they start declining and failing. So uh, please make sure if you do identify these in your trees, you're treating and protecting your trees from them. The other one I want to talk about is the bronze birch borer. So this pest uh, is definitely a tree killer. So keep that in mind. This is definitely one you want to treat for. Uh, it's kind of new to California. It's been up in the Pacific Northwest for a number of years. Uh, but during our last uh, significant drought, it came down out of the Pacific Northwest and pretty much moved all the way through the southern end of California within about three years. Uh, everyone kind of thought the birch trees were dying from drought because birch are water loving trees and in a drought, they don't do terribly well. Uh, so no one really noticed that this pest had come down and infested the area. So it is a flathead bore. So the way you can really tell if you've got this guy is you'll see a bore hole initially into the tree. There tends to be some sort of weeping, but the telltale sign of this particular pest is that D shaped exit hole you see over here next to this beetle because it's a flathead borer. So when it leaves the tree, one edge of the hole is flat, the other side is round. And then if you kind of dig in there, you'll get down there and you'll see the galleries of the damage that this pest is causing. And so being that our birch trees tend to be smaller, uh, tighter, narrow vascular tissue, when one of these beetles gets in there, they can do a lot of damage and actually kill a tree pretty quickly. So the management with this one in particular is a situation where if you're solely preventative, 
not a real pests in the area, you can do a soil dress of imidacloprid quite well against it. Um, that kind of keeps it from wanting to infest. However, if you already have an attack by this pest, and so you got a few trees in the area, you definitely want to bump up uh, your, your treatment. You want to go into more of a trunk injection application methodology with this one. Uh, if it's just in an auxiliary branch, sometimes you can just prune that branch out and then treat and protect the tree. Uh, however, if, if you kind of start getting infestation where you've already may have had a tree die and you've got attacks on other trees, you definitely have to move up and start using amomectin benzoate against this pest. Um, usually, I'll say if an infestation is severe, uh, the trees will die within one year of the infestation coming into the area. If it's a kind of minor, then you might have a couple years uh, before this pest starts wiping out the trees. But it is one of those things, the more stressed the trees are, the more likely this pest will infest. So this is definitely one of the beetles that is a foe. Uh, you definitely want to be treating for this one. And do be aware that uh, you do have to water these trees quite extensively uh, to keep their health during our, our stress conditions that we tend to have here in California for them. So that's our bronze birch borer. Now we're gonna get into thousand canker disease of walnuts. So I talk about this one. Uh, it's mainly in our black walnuts and the beetles actually bring in a geosmithia disease. And the reason why I talk about this one is because black walnut is throughout California, the West, it's, it's actually pretty heavily planted in some of the East and the, in the Midwestern or mid, uh, Eastern states. Um, but out here, we don't tend to pay too much attention to our black walnut trees. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of them, but usually the ones we do have are very large mature specimens. And what will tend to happen is you'll notice a dead branch at the top. You might think it's been broken from wind or, you know, maybe it's just something happened. Maybe a canker got in the branch and the branch dies out. Well, very quickly, almost within six months, you'll start noticing decline throughout the rest of the tree. And that's just because this disease is being vectored by this small beetle that basically does a mass attack. And so the beetle is actually what's vectoring in the disease. And so everywhere the beetle attacks, it introduces the disease. And that's part of the reason why we call it thousand cankers is because you get these mass attacks. So you get these thousands of cankers and they eventually kind of coalesce and they eventually just girdle out and kill the entire tree. So you can kind of see in the photos that the beetle does damage as well because of the galleries they're creating uh, underneath the bark in the phloem and xylem, but also because of the canker infection that's actually associated with where the beetle is entering into the tree. And so that being said, whenever we're dealing with a pest like this where we have an actual insect vectoring and a disease they're bringing, we're almost always having to do a combination application of insecticide and fungicide. So kind of keep that in mind when we're dealing with this one. You have to be very aggressive. You definitely want to prune out dead, uh, prune out any sort of infested wood, uh, and try and maintain the tree you have. Uh, so because they attack throughout the entire tree, uh, bark sprays are actually quite difficult. Uh, so we tend to go to the trunk injection methodology with amomectin benzoate on this one. So kind of keep that in mind. There's a few different fungicides uh, you can use. Um, I know we've been doing our trials with propagonazole uh, that have been working. The only problem we run into is uh, the trees are fairly sensitive uh, to that chemical compound. So sometimes we'll get marginal leaf burn. So though this is a pretty destructive pest, we definitely classify them as a foe and needs to treat for. Um, we try and do our treatments in the fall. So if there's any sort of uh, marginal burning of the leaves, they just drop off at the end of the year and the tree leaves out in the spring uh, protected and healthy. So with this one, uh, keep an eye out. Watch your black walnuts. It's the main one it attacks. Um, and right now, if you go on, there's some research still being done, particularly on this pest by UC Davis. Uh, so you can find some updates there. All right, Dutch elm disease, an oldie but a goodie. I know, I say that because if you guys remember, Dutch elm disease kind of swept through the US back in the old 80s, 90s, um, and then it kind of went quiet. We kind of forgot about it. I don't want to say we forgot about it, but maybe knowledge was slightly lost. Um, and now we're starting to see a resurgence of this. We've seen it up in uh, the Seattle area, uh, Portland, Oregon area. We've seen it in Sacramento and California and San Jose, and it's made all the way down to San Diego now. We're getting reports of it. Uh, so it's kind of made its way down the West again. Um, and the reason why we're kind of concerned about this one is because if we do have any nice American elms left, odds are it's, you know, they're quite old uh, and, and they're possibly a heritage tree at this point for us because uh, they survived pretty much the last infestation. Uh, 
so the biggest issue with Dutch elm disease is the actual disease uh, that is vectored between the trees. So it's a fungal infection and it can be vectored by these beetles or it can be just transmitted by root grafts. If you have a nice beautiful tree-lined street of American elms and their roots have all grafted together, they can literally just pass the disease from tree to tree down the street. So unfortunately with this one, it's kind of difficult to control. Uh, if you are in kind of a standalone situation, you might be able to protect the tree um, by giving some sort of bark spray or a trunk injection product uh, to, to mitigate the pest, um, but you also have to do the fungal treatment. Uh, so we've been using propoconazole on this very successfully. Uh, it's, a, it's a micro injection of it as opposed to doing those big macro injections back in the day with Arbortex. Uh, we've, got, we've gotten past that. We've made it easier. Um, and it's something you have to pretty much do every two years after the tree has been infected. But the reason why I bring this one up is because a lot of people say it looks very similar to fire blight. Uh, the way we tend to identify it is somebody calls in saying, hey, you know, my elm tree has fire blight. And we're like, well, elm trees don't get fire blight. So let's take a closer look and see what might be going on. And sure enough, we'll get out there and we'll, we'll check out the symptoms and we'll see the death and the dieback. And uh, sure enough, it's Dutch elm disease. But you can see it still gets that kind of dead branch, the leaves hang on, it kind of crooks. Um, but when infection, uh, their tissue. Oh, that's not good. My internet connection's unstable. Uh, hopefully I don't lose you guys. If, if I do, I apologize. Um, but also you'll see there on the trunk, you can see those tiny little uh, holes where the beetles have been. So that's how you can also see if you're being vectored by the pest. Um, usually that's the main way the disease is vectored unless you have a bunch of elm trees growing together in a park or on the street. And then it can also be vectored by the root grafts. So like I said, some people do insecticide preventative control uh, against this, especially if they know uh, the, ve the vector and the diseases in the area. Um, however, people don't tend to usually start treating the trees uh, until they actually have the fungal infection and then they can keep treating to suppress the disease. So that is our Dutch elm disease. So start looking again for that one since it, it seems to be rearing its ugly head again. And since we're on the elms, let's talk about the elm leaf beetle. So again, we're back in the beetles. And when we talk about friend, fro, or those you can ignore, um, this is one of those pests that do a lot of foliar damage. It, it feeds on the foliage. You can see the, the canopy of the tree can easily be lost if you have a really bad infestation. Um, the trick with this one though is, if it's a minor infestation, it's much easier to control than if you have a major infestation. And the, when we tend to see major infestations take place is when we've seen under treatment of chemicals. Um, so the main chemical people tend to use to treat for this one is imidacloprid. Uh, they like to do it as a soil drench, but unfortunately sometimes we don't get the right concentrations or they might be a line of trees. So people have a tendency of just doing their injections and hoping it kind of disperses and evens out. And unfortunately, if you get that under dose, you really don't get good control of this pest. Uh, so that's why we tend to say, don't even try and spray. Spray is not usually a good option. Uh, soil drench as a kind of a preventative or low maintenance is fine. Um, but if you're going to really try and knock down a whole population of this, you're much better off going off with an injection, trunk injection of imidacloprid. Um, some people have been using acephate. As soon as the pest is present and starts feeding, they'll do an injection of acephate. Um, that can be done. However, acephate's pretty short-lived inside the tree, uh, so you get much better residuals with the imidacloprid. Uh, so I tend to make that recommendation of using imidacloprid as opposed to the ace jet. If you want to get fast and immediate control, by all means, you can lead with acephate for your trunk injection and follow with imidacloprid. That will work as well. But remember, don't, don't mix them in the bottles. So this one is one of those that we tend not to ignore solely for the fact that once the population builds, it can be extremely hard to control. All right, oak twig girdler. So this is one that's just been starting to pop up again in the last I want to say five years that we've really kind of been noticing the increased population and the spreading of the population. Uh, kind of started in central California, the uh, Santa Maria, Paso Robles area. And this pest has an every two, it has a two year life cycle to it. So we don't see it moving too quickly. We don't see it being too terribly destructive. And actually we tend to refer to it as, you know, mother nature's own pruning brigade. Cause that's essentially what this pest does. So if you'll kind of see that picture on the bottom uh, left, you'll see that 
on the oaks, you'll get these kind of like twigs or branches dying out towards the end. And so essentially what's happened is this little guy has borne in, got the larvae in there, it ends up girdling that piece of uh, uh, tree tissue and killing out that branch. And so what ends up happening though, is if you get a really high infestation, uh, you can do some significant pruning uh, on the trees. And so we have seen that, but we have not seen it to the extent where it's ever killed a tree. Uh, so it's one of those pests that if it's minor, it's not an issue, it's not needed to be treated for. If it's a major infestation, the trees are already stressed, then it is something you might wanna consider treating for. Um, we tend to say go with the emmectin benzoate on this one because that chemical lasts a minimum of two years in the tree. And since we're working on a two-year life cycle with this pest, it, it tends to be the best option. But it tends to be one of those one applications and done. Um, but we now have seen it spreading more throughout uh, California uh, and just had some reports of it up in the Reno area. So be aware of it. Uh, it is kind of coming back. And uh, unfortunately, major infestations on stress trees can be killers. But for the most part, we tend to ignore this one. <laughs> the Western Oak Bark Beetle. This is a native beetle that likes to attack our oak trees. And this has always kind of been on our ignore list because it is native. It only tends to rear, rear its ugly head when we get into drought conditions and their populations can grow. But for the most part, our native oaks are fairly used to this pest um, and they're not terribly destructive. So that being said, we've pretty much always had this guy on our ignore list. Uh, until recently, a few years ago, he started vectoring this disease called foamy bark canker disease. It's another type of geosmithia disease. And so in this case, the beetle bores in, it carries in the disease. The disease causes this kind of foaming or sapping nature looking to the attack sites. Um, and it's actually this disease that is killing the tree. The, the geosmithy disease gets in there and girdles that vascular tissue and can kill the tree off actually quite quickly. And again, it's partly because you get this mass attack, so you get real dispersal of the fungal agent and therefore it can quickly uh, girdle and, vas and clog up the vascular tissue. Uh, so right now with this one, uh, we've been doing injections of uh, uh, emmectin benzoate for it. Uh, we've been seeing people do bark sprays, uh, uh, pyrethroids, um, and things of that nature. Um, on our coast live oaks, uh, if they're a more uh, immature tree, the bark's not so thick, the bark sprays have been fairly effective. On the older, more mature trees, unfortunately the bark sprays just have not been able to penetrate well and get the correct uh, dosing in there to actually be effective. And on the red oak trees, when this pest attacks a red oak tree, the whole oak just turns wet. It looks like someone hosed the tree down with water. Um, most of the red oaks succumb very quickly. Uh, by the time someone identifies what's going on, the tree has pretty much been girdled and dies. And it's partly because of their different growth habit. Uh, coast live oaks like to be um, kind of thick barked, multi-branching, whereas our red oaks aren't. So once they get into that main stem, that main trunk, uh, they can girdle it off pretty quickly. If you have a multi-branching oak and one branch happens to get this infection, cut it out, uh, ch chip it if you can, solarize it if you can as well. Um, and uh, treat the remaining branches, and you should be able to save the tree. But remember, you're going after the disease as well as the fungal infection. Uh, and again, uh, the propoconazoles, the zoles, uh, they tend to work well for geosmithia infections. So that is one way we can kind of treat and protect for this one. But this one, again, it falls into the faux category now because of the disease it's vectoring. We still see western oak bark beetle out there. Not all of them are vectoring the disease but you can clearly tell who is by the, the foaming cankers on the tree. Oh, sorry, this was the close-up of what it looks like of the uh, geosmithia actually causing that girdling effect in the vascular tissue on the tree. And that's just a quick close-up of what it looks like when you get that foaming or oozing out. Um, if you have a western oak bark beetle attacking the tree, you'll see a lot of frass coming out. They create a lot of frass on the trunk of the tree. Uh, so you'll tend to know that you have the western oak bark beetle there, um, but until they start weeping or foaming, uh, you don't have to worry too much because uh, they don't—they're not currently vectoring that foamy bark canker disease. Okay, gold spotted oak borer. Uh, so this one, friend foe or those we can ignore, definitely falls into the foe category. Uh, he is another one of our oak killers. Uh, he will uh, destroy and kill oak trees. He prefers our coast live oaks. 
Um, but he will also uh, get into our black oaks, valley oaks. Um, but this one is kind of unique in the fact that, again, it's a flathead borer. So when it attacks a tree, it's going to create that D-shaped exit hole with the rounded side and the flat top. So that's what kind of makes it the marker of identifying what's going on. When you first look at the tree, you'll kind of notice a thinning of the canopy. Uh, and you're like, okay, this tree looks stressed. Let's see what's going on. Maybe it's drought, right? That tends to be our first go-to here on the West is drought. Um, and you'll kind of get it closer and then you might start noticing that there's kind of some sort of, uh, you know, kind of like oozy and dark spots on the tree. That's pretty much where the pest has landed, laid its brood and the brood is bored in. And then that brood is going to create galleries underneath the bark. And when they exit, that's when you get those D-shaped exit holes. So just know that when you, once you've found those D-shaped exit holes, the pest has been in the tree and it has caused damage. Uh, and it's now leaving that tree and flying out to more trees. So um, whenever we actually identify this in an area, we always say you need to get on treatment immediately. Um, it's, if it's kind of suspected to be in your, in your area, uh, soil drenches of imidacloprid have been kind of the preventative protocol. Um, but once the pest is actually in your area, uh, you're much better going to the trunk injection methodology and getting the full dose inside the tree. Uh, you can do the imidacloprid, which will last a year. Um, they're still working on the research for the amomect and benzoate to last two years. Uh, so hopefully that's something we'll, we'll know here soon and, and get research confirmation on the amomect and benzoate. Uh, this is what the larvae actually look like inside the tree. If you want to cut into one of those oozing areas on the tree, um, you might be able to find one. Uh, you'll also be able to see the galleries underneath the bark to help you identify what's going on. We are tracking this pest, so if for some reason you do happen to find and identify it, please do report it. Uh, you can tell me, you can call your county ag, but yes, please report it to someone because we are tracking this. Uh, we want to see how it's moving. Currently, it's made as far as the Los Padres National Forest um, or Los Angeles National Forest, um, but it's going to move in firewood, so it's going to move quickly when it does. So it's really important that you're kind of keeping your eyes out for it, and it's one of the few flathead borers that we actually have attacking our oak trees. So if you see flathead borer, be suspicious, do a little more research, and, and, and get into finding out what's going on on this one. Okay, the other one that is mainly down in uh, Southern California at this point well, it's now central as well. I, I can't just say Southern California. It's moved up into San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara County as well. And it's the invasive shot hole borer. Uh, you may have heard it referred to as the polyphagous shot hole, shot hole borer or the polyphagous shot hole borer or the crucio shot hole borer or the T shot hole borer. Yep, now you can see where we've just come together on one name and we're calling it the invasive shot hole borer. Uh, they're an ambrosia beetle that are all very similar. Uh, they're just kind of slightly different at the genetic DNA level, but they have the whole same idea where these beetles actually bore into the tree and introduce a fungal infection again. Just like we saw with the thousand cankers disease, it's the same idea. You get this little ambrosia beetle, but the difference with this one is the beetle's not actually feeding on the tree. It's boring into the tree and it's actually bringing the fungal infection with it. And then it grows that fungal infection inside the galleries in the tree and it feeds on that fungal infection. It lays its brood in the galleries and then the brothers and sisters in those broods mate. So when they come back out, they're all ready to bore, uh, they're already pregnant and ready to bore right back into trees. So they can have a very short life cycle of only six weeks, um, but they do seem to have peak seasons of when they're flying and when they're reproducing. And they do kind of have, I don't want to say optimum temperatures, uh, but if you'll find during the hot summer, you'll notice them on the north side of the tree where it's a little bit cooler. And if it's kind of more of our winter months, you'll find them more on the south side of the tree where it's a little bit warmer. Uh, so they're a fairly impressive uh, pest who definitely, once they get into an area, has a great ability to infest because it can feed on over 300 different tree species. Right now, it's only reproducing in about 60 or so, what we call host trees. Uh, and at that, they don't necessarily kill all the trees. So when we look at it as, you know, friend, foe, or those to ignore, um, because it's an invasive pest and because it does have the ability to kill trees, we definitely look at it as a foe. Some people have chosen to kind of put it on the ignore uh, level. Uh, unfortunately, with that, it just allows it to increase its populations and spread. And since it's an invasive, we really try and stop that from happening. 
So, and if it can get into certain type trees, it, it can be quite detrimental. We've seen probably mostly sycamores, liquid ambers, olives, some oaks succumbing specifically to this pest. Uh, we haven't seen too many willows, or actually, I'm sorry, we've seen the willows die out in the uh, Tijuana River Valley, uh, but so far we haven't seen too many of our urban willows die from this pest. So it's kind of an interesting pest in the fact that um, it can do an extreme amount of damage, uh, but it doesn't always necessarily kill the tree. And it's partly because that beetle bores in and it tends to want to go into the heartwood. So we tend to see more damage in the heartwood. We don't see the galleries underneath the bark. Uh, so if you were to say, just pull some bark off, all you're going to see is a tiny hole about the size of the lead of a mechanical pencil. And then once you get in further, you're going to notice the actual damage of the galleries. Uh, so with this one, we, we tend to say, uh, if you're in the flight, in one of the peak flight seasons, which tend to be around April-ish, uh, then again in kind of October, uh, you may want to do a bark spray, uh, as well as doing a trunk injection of emmectin benzoate with it. And then for going after the actual fungal infection of fusarium, uh, we found that injection of the fungicides work much better. Um, there's a few different fungicides that work. It's mainly the zols like uh, propiconazole, tebiconazole uh, that work against this in particular. So if you have a tree that has a couple attacks on it, you definitely want to treat with both the insecticide and the fungicide. Uh, that way you can take care of uh, both the pests and the disease. If you're doing this kind of surely on a preventative basis, you can get away with just using the insecticide because at that point the uh, fungal infection has not yet been introduced. So keep that in mind, but we do have to use fairly high rates of insecticides against this one. Since the pest doesn't exactly feed on the tree, it's more of an incidental contact, so we have to have fairly high concentrations in the tree for this one. And so there's a little bit more about the actual disease that it's vectoring. Uh, so the fusarium, you can see the staining going on in there. And for some trees, this is much more virulent than others. Uh, for instance, the one I like to use as an example, because we all like our olive trees, and they tend to be high value trees. Um, Usually the fungus alone can actually kill an olive tree. So you may not even have a whole lot of attack sites, but the fusarium is so virulent olives that the olives will still die just from a few attacks. So we tend to say be much more proactive against protecting against your olives because of the, the reaction to the fungal infection. So you can see how that infection gets in there, it's introduced by the pest and then it spreads throughout the vascular tissue of the tree. So if you guys have questions on these, I forgot to mention that in the beginning, feel free in the chat box down at the bottom um, you can type in any questions, and when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions for you on this one. Okay, so I like to get, I, I had to include this one, even though uh, a weevil is, is not a beetle. Um, some people refer to them as snout-nosed beetles, um, but they are not. But I include this one because it's a good opportunity to talk about the South American palm weevil, which is another invasive pest that we have in Southern California. And it's one of those pests that can move incredibly quickly just by lack of knowledge. So I pretty much include this one in every presentation I do now. And, and the reason is, is it mainly attacks our Canary Island date palms. Uh, they have found it in a couple other palms, but it seemed to be just hanging out there and not necessarily feeding and being destructive. Uh, so at this point in time, we're mainly looking for it in the Canary Island date palms. And so this is a weevil that gets into the main, uh, basically, meristem of uh, the palm tree and feeds on the new growth that is forming and coming out. So when the new growth actually expands, you can see all these notches uh, that have been cut into the leaf tissue or the, the frond tissue. And that's what's actually the indicator that this pest is actually residing in the palm. Not many of us get up in the bucket trucks and check the mare stems of our palms. Uh, so we kind of wait to see the expansion of the frond and see if we have an infection. Thing is, is our Canary Island date palms, they're high value trees. They're usually very mature, and so um, to replace one can be very expensive. So people have been doing soil drenches of imidacloprid uh, as a preventative application for this, um, and that seems to be working. However, we have to get the knowledge out there so people are aware of it. Um, right now, I said it's still in Southern California, um, kind of, you know, really in San Diego County, a little east of San Diego County. We haven't really seen it uh, get up into Orange County or anything like that yet um, in any sort of like infestation level. But the problem with this one is most of our palm trees ship out of Southern California. So if you were planting a palm up in Northern California or even out in Vegas, the problem is, is a lot of our stock comes out of Southern California. So we know the pest is there. So unless you're buying from a nursery who's got a kind of a protocol in place of doing midicloprid soil drenches as preventative, 
you're at the risk of this pest traveling with the palm. Because what do they do, right? They, they tie up the palm fronds. They, they then pull down the palm, ship it to wherever it's going. You're supposed to plant it out and leave it tied up until you see the new growth coming out of the, the ties, right? Well, unfortunately, by that time, if you untie the fronds, you're going to see a massive infestation, and the meristem may have already actually already been eaten out of it. So we have seen this pest kill. So it's definitely in our faux category. Um, so we're definitely actively treating against this one in particular. Um, so we can do trunk injection if you've already seen signs and you want to get the chemical up quicker to the meristem. Uh, people, that's when people tend to go to the actual trunk injection of the imidacloprid product. So with this one in particular, inspect the palms before they ship out. If you're going to be using palms in your in, in any sort of like landscaping, and then while the palm is still on the ground before it's being planted up, open it up, check that meristem area, see if there's any signs of feeding, just to make sure that you know you're not possibly vectoring or transporting this pest. Uh, and then um, that that soil joint midacloprid is always a very good option against this one as well. So I know I snuck in a weevil in a beetle talk, but we'll just call him the snout-nosed uh, beetle for now. So the other one that I, I kind of talk about, just because I'm talking about palms and we're, we're talking about beetles and borers, uh, this one is mainly out in uh, Arizona. We've seen some getting into Nevada. Uh, there, there has been some incidents out in the uh, Palm Springs area of this giant palm borer. And here's the fun part. So we just talked about that uh, weevil that attacks the uh, meristem area and the new tissue. Well, this guy is actually more down in the uh, roots. So he, you're not going to really notice you have this one uh, until you see the decline of the palm. And then when you go ahead and remove the palm, you're going to see the damage that this, this bore has done uh, down at the base of your palm and in the root area. So unfortunately, it is quite large, as you can see uh, by the measuring tape there on this guy. Um, and so they can do a significant amount of damage very quickly. And again, it's in our, our bigger palms, our canary and date palms and our fan palms. So just kind of be aware of this one. Um, at this point in time, they, they have not found a good control uh, for this particular pest. They've been looking at different types of soil drenches uh, for it. Uh, but as of right now, inspection is your best option if you have a palm declining. Uh, get in there and kind of look to see what might be going on, see if you can identify this giant palm borer. All right, so now we're gonna get into bark beetles. And I kind of put these guys as their own whole classification because there's so many of them. Uh, we have another webinar coming up with the experts of bark beetles, uh, Dr. Chris Fedick and Dr. Groen Grossman. So please, by all means, I think it's coming up uh, sometime in May. You definitely wanna jump on and hear that one. I'm gonna kind of give you a little precursor on our bark beetles and kind of go over the main ones. Uh, but I always kind of start with the fact that our bark beetles are what we tend to call sleeper pests. I mean, we all know that bark beetles can and will kill trees, uh, but we have a tendency of somewhat ignoring them until it's too late. Uh, and what I mean by that is we might know we have bark beetles in the area, but we try and wait until we see signs or symptoms on a particular tree to actually try and, and save it. And unfortunately, a lot of times, by the time you get to that point, it's too late. So this was just a photo that I had taken that I, I wanted to share. The photo, uh, the tree circled uh, in red right here, uh, that photo was taken about three months prior to the photo on the right where I came back and it already torched red and dead. And essentially I was out there staring at it in November and by the time we warmed up at the end of February, uh, the tree had figured out that it was girdled and when it tried to pull water, it just died and torched red. So usually that's when people tend to call, they already see the discoloration of the dying of the tree and unfortunately, at that point, the beetles have already done their damage and there's no saving the tree. So when we start talking about beetle attacks, we kind of put it in very general terms. Uh, if the tree is still green and healthy looking, it usually means you have some attack sites. You might see, uh, you know, a few attack sites on the trunk associated with it. Once that, that canopy has started to turn any sort of off color, uh, that's when we're in stage two. We know the galleries have already been made underneath the bark and has disrupted the vascular tissue. Um, at that point, we know the tree can't be saved. And then we refer as red is dead. That's when you see all the exit holes all over the bark of the pest exiting the tree and moving on to the next one. Um, the one thing I, I, I tend to also harp on is if it's gray, as in the canopy is gray, that means that tree should be removed a long time ago. <laughs> uh, it's been standing dead for a while. 
And that's been our biggest issue with bark beetles is leaving dead wood or dead and dying trees standing or just chunked on the ground. Because unfortunately those beetles can still continue to feed and reproduce in those trees. It's not until they've fully dried out that they're actually no longer a viable food source for the tree or for the, for the beetles. So if someone's come through and dropped a bunch of logs, just know that is a breeding ground. Uh, you can cover those logs in plastic and help solarize those trees and stop the spread of the beetles. Or if someone's come through and done a bunch of uh, cuts and they just left these like, you know, stumps out of the ground, know everywhere that that stump still has bark covering it, that's dinner for a beetle. Um, so if you are gonna leave stumps behind, make sure you rip the bark off so that way it dries out and exposes it so it can't be a food source. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the main pest we have here. It's the Western Pine Beetle. Um, this is our number one pest in the West. Uh, pretty much it's not until you kind of get more towards uh, Colorado where you tend to see the population switch to being more mountain pine beetle. But out here from the coast uh, up into uh, the Sierras, it's mainly the Western pine beetle. And so this one has always kind of been noted for going into the lodgepole, the ponderosas, it'll get into our Jeffreys. Um, but we have a ton of different beetle types out here. So I'm just going to kind of hit the basics on this one. Western pine beetle mainly attacks the, what we like to refer to as the middle third of the tree. It tends not to go for the very tip of the tree, and it's not usually down at the base of the tree. It's usually in the middle third of the tree. And you'll usually see uh, pitch tubes on the outside of the tree, about the size of a wad of gum usually. So these beetles uh, tend to want to fly in the warmer months of, you know, May, July, or May, June, July, August. Um, however, I will say we saw documented attacks of Western pine beetle uh, the second week of February this year. It was just because we had a really warm, dry February that these beetles already became active. So keep that in mind. Uh, we pretty much at this point, we'll probably see them flying through October. Uh, so this should be a bad year for bark beetles. And if they are correct in predicting that we are going to be in another drought, then we know these beetles are just gonna be that much more successful because that's how a tree protects itself against bark beetles. If the tree has water, it can just pitch and sap those beetles out, and then the beetles can't reproduce and we keep low population. When the trees are drought stressed and they don't have water in their vascular tissue, they can't fight those beetles off. And therefore the beetles are successful, their populations grow until they get to lethal levels. And that's when we start seeing the dead and dying forests. So if we're in the urban canopy, feel free, water your tree, that'll definitely help. And then watch for these pests. Keep an eye on, see if they're invading, see if they're in the area. Um, the other one is the mountain pine beetle. Uh, this is the one uh, that I said mainly we've seen in Colorado, but we've seen come over into the Sierras. Again, it attacks in the middle third of the tree. Uh, the beetles themselves look very similar. You're not gonna really notice the difference with your naked eye. Uh, and their pitch tubes are about the same. So how do we identify the difference between them? It's their galleries and it has the tendency to be uh, the trees that they want to attack first. So this one also is a main vector of blue stain fungus. So it, it's one of those scenarios, other beetles can vector this disease as well. Uh, we found that it was more prevalent in the mountain pine beetle to vector it in initially. And so they have a tendency of wanting to bring it in. Uh, but as you can see, it gets into the lodgepole, ponderosas, dug fir, white pines. Um, we tend to see a, a pretty broad spectrum with this with particular fungal infection. So again, we have a beetle attacking and bringing in the disease. So we have to do that combination application of insecticide as well as fungicide. So I always classify bark beetles as foes just for the fact that they kill trees and we're trying to save trees. Um, but this guy always makes it to the top of the list since they are, are very much known for bringing in the blue stain fungus. But the Western uh, pine beetle can carry it as well. So the other beetle that I want to talk about that is similar but very different is the red turpentine beetle. So we have this one throughout California. Seems to be a little bit more prevalent in the Monterey area at this point, but we've seen quite a bit up in the Sacramento. Uh, we have seen some out in Yosemite. Uh, so what this one does, it doesn't really fly to the tree, so it tends to attack the bottom third of the tree. It climbs up the tree and then goes in. And so this beetle is actually significantly larger, so the pitch tubes it will make is significantly larger. Um, they'll be like the size of my fist. I mean, they're large sapping pitch tubes. And every now and again, you can kind of pull the pitch tube off and, and literally start seeing that beetle uh, boring in. This one doesn't stay out in the uh, phloem and xylem tissue. Uh, this one will go into the heartwood. 
So we, we don't necessarily see the distinct galleries underneath the bark so much, um, but unfortunately, since they're kind of in a condensed attack area in that bottom like three feet of the tree, uh, we tend to see a lot of trees succumbing to this pest just because the uh, damage is all happening in a much smaller area. So with that being said, if you're gonna be treating against this one, whether you're going with bark spray or trunk injection, go as low as you possibly can. This is one of the few times I'll say, take the time to do a little excavation. Dig some of that duff and that debris and that dirt away from the trunk. Try get down as low as you can get to make sure you're getting that chemical below where that pest is attacking. Uh, that'll be your best option to get quick control of this particular pest. Um, but it, it's definitely destructive. Uh, and it, it's one of those things, when you get an outbreak in an area, uh, you tend to know you'll, you'll see the trees declining pretty quickly. Um, rarely do we see this as a standalone pest. Um, in the Monterey, on the Monterey Pines, we have, but mainly we've already seen someone else attacking the tree and stressing the tree, and then this beetle tends to come in. Um, whether it's an Ibsen Graber attacking or it's a Western pine beetle attacking, this guy tends to want to be secondary. So kind of keep that in mind. You're probably already feed, fighting some other beetle infestation uh, prior to this one coming in. And I mentioned the Ibsen Graber beetle. Uh, Ibsen Graber beetle is probably one of the most profuse bark beetles we have uh, in the West. I think we have over 300 species in the West. Um, and the one we tend to see very commonly is our, our tip Ip, I refer to it as, because he tends to want to attack the top third of the tree. Um, so he makes it very difficult to identify them. Sometimes on a good day, if uh, you got some little tiny pitch tubes that they can create, you go out there at noon with some botanoculars and you can actually kind of see the glistening of the pitch. Um, sometimes it'll be some sort of frass, really hard to see with binoculars. The real identifier is because you'll tend to see a dead branch or two scattered throughout the canopy. And once you get up there and look, either that branch has gotten the, the Ibsen Graber beetle in it and it's girdled the branch and the branch has died. Or in a couple of occasions, I've seen it where it actually girdles right beneath the branch and actually causes the branch to die. Um, but the nice part is, is the damage they do is quite a bit smaller. So usually we can still treat a tree and protect a tree even once it, it has the engraver beetles. But just know the engraver beetles are almost always like the precursor. You tend to get those guys in because they're much more common. Once that tree gets stressed with the Ips engraver, that's when you're going to get the western pine beetle, mountain pine beetle wanting to come in because that tree is stressed. Um, so like I said, we've seen in instances where this pest has just attacked the top third and the top of the tree dies out and the rest of the tree stays fine um, until that western mountain pine beetle gets in and, and then the rest of the tree goes. So keep that in mind. All these beetles are going to be much more prevalent in drought uh, and with us going into another drought, be aware of it, start watching, um, and identify it quickly so you can get the treatment in quickly. Because if you're going with bark sprays, you gotta try and cover the entire tree. If you're going with trunk injection, it takes a chemical about five weeks to circulate throughout the tree and protect it. Uh, so the sooner you can react, the better by far. And then, because you know, it wasn't difficult enough, uh, we have these beetles also vectoring uh, pine pitch canker, uh, which is in the Fusarium family again. And in this case, it started kind of out in Monterey, uh, we mainly saw it on the Monterey Pines. It kind of was like ground zero was Pebble Beach. Uh, the trees looked awful. No one was really there for the trees or there for the golf, so it was fine. Sorry, kidding. Um, but that being said, uh, it really allowed to take hold. And then the nursery industry kind of figured out that Monterey Pines were quick and easy to propagate. And the next thing we knew, we were growing Monterey Pines and shipping them out throughout California. And, and now we've seen the disease throughout California. We Thought it might stay in the coastal climates, not so. It's, it's even all the way out in the Palm Desert and Los, or Palm Springs area. So that being said, when we're specifically working with this, uh, watch out for those engraver beetles, those twig beetles. If you have this disease in the area, you gotta be treating for the beetles since they're one of the vectors. And then you're actually treating for the disease itself. Um, so we found that propoconazole works very well against it, but it's one of those things you have to keep your treatments up. Uh, kind of once you get those infections in and the infection is in the area, you have to have to keep uh, suppressing that disease. So unfortunately, it's not a one and done type application. Uh, you're kind of committed to a project when you kind of get this infestation of peach canker disease. Spruce beetles. We have them here. They're kind of an overlooked beetle. Um, sadly, uh, 
once we get a spruce tree that actually has the beetles being identified in it, the spruce tree is almost always gone, almost dead. And it's just because we're not looking for it. So I'm not gonna take too much time, just be aware. We have the spruce beetle here in California. Keep your eye open for it. Uh, if you notice your spruce declining, get up close, see if you see any boreholes. If you do, definitely start treating immediately. But unfortunately, mites. Mites are always the first thing people tend to see and mites stress the tree. And the next thing you know, the beetles will come in and, and kill the tree. So pay attention to that one. The other one that we have out here that is actually very prevalent is uh, the Doug fir beetle. And just know it doesn't just attack Doug firs. Uh, we, we named it that, but uh, it will go after almost any true fir. So be aware. Uh, this guy is quite prevalent, especially up in our, in our mountains. Uh, he's actually been quite destructive uh, in our drought. So with this guy in particular, um, I haven't seen too much of him in our urban canopy. He seems to be more in our foothills and out in our forests. Uh, but just be aware, it's another beetle we have out here that we're battling against. Um, and I wanna say he's like a combination between the Western pine beetle and an Ipsen graver beetle. Um, he, he seems to have a higher population and be more in a mass attack type uh, scenario um, like the Ipsen graver, but he's a little bit larger like the Western and can do quite a bit of damage. And then this is the one that kind of gets mixed in there. So I know it's a beetle talk, but I'm talking about pitch moths. And it's just because I've had a lot of scenarios where people are blaming the damage that's being done by a pitch moth on bark beetles. And it's not, this is a moth, so it's gonna be coming out in the dusk and evening hours. The odds of you seeing it are not terribly likely. Um, so keep in mind, if you happen to see any sort of pitch mass at like a branch uh, collar, or at a branch, it can even be a branch that's been pruned and, and removed. These guys almost always go into the branch collar. And so you can see the larvae in there, they're quite large. Uh, it's not a massive infestation, they kind of stay in that pitch area. So if you happen to want to climb a ladder, get up there, rich that, uh, just kind of rip that pitch mass, mass off, odds are you'll be able to find that larvae in there and you can literally just pull it out. Uh, so this one in particular, just be aware of it. It's been mistaken as a bark beetle, but it is not and it almost always goes into branch collars, whether there's a branch there or not. Um, it's nice that the treatment's the same. They're, they will be uh, taken care of with emmect and benzoate as well. So if you did happen to misidentify, you're covered. Uh, the same chemical will, will work for it. But how do we tell which beetle we really have? I love this. It's something people don't always realize, but most of our beetles that are doing their damage in that vascular tissue underneath the bark leave a gallery. And this gallery is where they've borne in and their larvae have created galleries uh, in their feeding, and it's like a signature. So as you can see on the far left, you have a mountain pine beetle. That adult tends to want to go in and straight up, and the larvae go out to either side. If you look at the western pine beetle, they're uh, kind of in the middle. You can see there is no rhyme or reason. That is just chaos. Um, but you'll notice they don't cross lines terribly often, so that was kind of interesting. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, if you need to identify which beetle you have, by all means, pull the bark, take some photos, send them to me. Um, I'll be happy to help you identify which pest you're dealing with. Um, the nice part about that is the treatment option is pretty much the same. So the original treatment methodology was always kind of a bark spray to the trunk. Uh, we were using things like um, Carbrol, that was a common one. People know it was seven. Um, unfortunately, we've we really gotten away from the bark sprays unless we're doing it as kind of a temporary uh, protection. And it's only for the fact that the pest cycles of these pests are no longer short enough that a bark spray will fully protect the pest while, while it's uh, out in flight. And the other thing is it doesn't treat the, the fungal infection that the pest is now vectoring. So we've kind of gotten away from the bark sprays unless we're doing that in combination with trunk injection uh, in kind of peak season to do an extra kind of application to cover our bases. Um, I've had a lot of questions about splat, what it is, how it works. Uh, if you haven't heard of splat, it's basically, it's a river moan. So for instance, beetles have this ability to communicate with basically pheromones. And so for instance, when a beetle finds a good tree, specifically the mountain pine beetle, it'll send out this pheromone that says, wow, I found a great dinner stop. Everyone come here. Um, well, it has the same effect when the, the restaurant gets too full, basically. If there's too many beetles already in that tree, it'll put off a new pheromone saying, hey, this one's too full, find your own place to eat. Um, and so that's kind of what they've captured in this pheromone. Uh, the problem with it is it works very well on mountain pine beetle. That's what it was based on. Uh, we've been trying to use it more out here in the west, and unfortunately it's not as effective against the western pine beetle 
or the Ibsen gray root beetle or the red turpentine beetle. So we've had some confusion out there of people trying to control all the different beetles that we've had attacking in our forest with this particular product and they haven't had great results. And that's because the majority of the pests attacking our forest at this point in time is not the mountain pine beetle. He is one of the five pests that tend to be out there attacking the forests, um, but repelling the one doesn't really tend to do a whole lot of good. So we saw great success with this product uh, in, in Colorado where they did have mainly a mountain pine beetle outbreak. Uh, and they were able to help protect some trees with this methodology. Uh, but as for us here in the West, it, it's not terribly effective. It's rather inexpensive, as you can see. Um, and it's one of those things homeowners like to be able to go out and do something on their own. We just have to make sure we don't have any false expectations uh, of how this is going to work. They're going to keep the mountain pine beetles off, but that's about it. There's a good chance the trees will still succumb and die from western pine beetle or ifs or, or red turpentine or bug fur, all the other myriad of beetles we have out there. So I always tend to recommend uh, the Arbor Jet trunk injection methodology, the measure, the drill, the plug, the inject. You can use a, any one of the systems to do these applications now with all the different uh, triage chemicals we have available. Um, but the whole idea is you're putting the chemical inside the trunk of the tree, in that xylem phloem tissue where the pest is actually feeding. So this is one misnomer that I want people to understand is what happens once this chemical gets actually in the vascular tissue and the beetle has to bore in and get that chemical. So you will still see attack sites, but the thing is we're killing that pest. It's not going to reproduce, it's not going to fly off to another tree, we're actually reducing that population. So it's a very important way of understanding how we can really protect our trees and reduce their populations. And of course, the most important part is the chemical stays trapped inside the tree. It's not in the air, it's not in the soil, it's not in the water. We can do this in riparian areas, we can do this alongside streams. Um, so that's one of those big things we tend to run into with doing our applications, is, is people need to be able to do it in a, uh, a safe manner. And so by doing it with trunk injection, you really reduce your exposure to the public and to the applicator. And it's part of the reason why we can say up to two years on the triage labels is because it is trapped inside the tree and it's not being broken down by sunlight or by microbes in the soil. So keep that in mind. I just kind of want to go over the ins and outs of why we're doing the trunk injection specifically for these beetles, especially for like the Western pine beetle. Uh, we've been doing research with this pest uh, and disease and treatment with emivectin benzoate for years. This one was back in 2005 when we were testing against sprays. And as you can see, the trunk injection by far was much more effective than doing us sprays uh, with, in this case, was onyx and fipronil. We did it again. We wanted to prove out the kind of the timing of it. And honestly, the best time to do your applications is in fall. Uh, it gives the chemical plenty of time to circulate inside the tree so that when the beetle does start flying, the chemical's already protecting the tree. So like this year with the beetles flying in February, it's a real issue. You might be just finally getting after the trees and starting to do applications in February. Now you've got about five weeks it's going to take to circulate. So that's why sometimes we'll see them team up with a trunk injection of a bark spray. So that bark spray will protect during the time that the trunk injected material is circulating throughout the tree. Um, there's three different emectin benzoates we have. We have the very original Triad, which is a restricted use product. Um, this one has all the bark beetles on the label. Then we have our Triage G4, which is a general use, which means it's not federally restricted. It's actually dropped it down to a caution label. Still has all of our bark beetles on the label. Um, you'll find this one wants to go into pine trees a little bit easier. Uh, so you have less of a, a difficulty of getting it in the tree. But ideally now we're using the triage R10 against bark beetles. Uh, this is a new one that's got twice the concentration, so we only have to put in half the dose. And if anybody's tried to actually inject a pine tree, you'll know they're not easy. So the less product we can put in, the better. Um, especially if we're doing kind of that disease pest combination treatment where we're going after a blue stain fungus as well as the pest. You want to try and reduce your dose as much as possible. And the other nice thing about the triage R10 is the fact that it can be mixed with propozole. So that's another one of those propoconazole products that we're using against uh, the blue stain fungus. So they can be mixed in the system and then injected. This is the only triage that has that mixing ability on the label. So by all means, if you're going to be treating for bark beetles in, in pine trees, you definitely want to be looking at the triage R10, especially if you're mixing with to go against the blue stain fungus. And then this is what we're using against the blue stain fungus, the propozole. Uh, so keep in mind, in, in California, we have a 2 E label with this particular product, so you definitely want to print off and have your 2 E label with you when you're doing these treatments. Um, and it's one of those things, we really recommend it as a preventative if you can. Uh, so if you know blue stains in the area, but when you're not positive if your tree has it that you're treating, 
by all means, propozole, the fungicides are, are rather inexpensive. It is definitely worth your time to, to go ahead and get it in in advance. And then by all means, water. We have to water the trees to make it work. So if you are in a very drought stressed area, uh, try and get a little water to the tree prior. It'll make your injections go that much quicker and easier. And then again, if you can, after, see if you can get the homeowner to give a little bit of water to actually get it moving up and throughout the system. Not a whole lot of water. Don't, don't let them drown the tree as homeowners tend to like to do. Uh, so give them parameters about how much watering they should be doing. And then if they're gonna take the time to water, tell them to pop in some of the uh, hydrogen and humectants products. That just really helps hold that water in the root zone for that tree and doesn't let it wick away to the other surrounding dry soil. So it makes their water and application worthwhile. There's a few of them on the market. Um, Site One carries a product called Moisture Manager. Um, we have most of the other distributors call area something called Hydrotain. And then um, as Arborjet, we have our Nutru, which also has a few other components to make trees healthier, such as kelp and micronutrients and things. But if they're gonna take the time to water, feel free, tell them to add this in. It's not expensive, but it does a world of help for those trees that are drought stressed. And then there's a few things you can do beyond just trunk injection for protecting your trees. Uh, whatever you do, don't prune the trees between April and October. That, that stress pheromone that trees can actually kind of give off uh, being pruned literally attract in the beetles. So if you do have a beetle infestation in an area and you prune your tree, it is just like a big open restaurant sign for them uh, to come in. And then of course, watering the trees, that's huge. And like I said, add in that amendment to help hold that water in the root zone. And then always try and remove any sort of dead or dying material as soon as possible. That includes stumps, like I said, pull the bark, solarize uh, with clear plastic. It's amazing how much you can help keep that population in control once you kind of do those steps. And then these are just a couple to watch for. These are foes we don't yet have exactly, um, but they are definitely foes. They are all tree killers. So the Asian longhorn beetle, look out for this guy. He's kind of hard to miss actually. Uh, the black body with the white spots and then that black and white striped antenna. Yeah, they, he catches your eye. If you catch this guy, you're gonna be showing it to people. So don't just keep it to yourself. Show it with, show it with County Ag, let me know. But as you can see, that hole is pretty significant. It's about the size of my pinky finger. Wouldn't wanna put my pinky finger in there. I'd be afraid of what might get it. Um, but yes, so keep in mind, this guy is pretty distinctive. If you see him, say something. And then the emerald ash borer. This one, you've probably heard about it because it's out in the Midwest. We don't have it here in the West yet. Will it get here? Yeah, probably, eventually. Might get shipped here on pallets or it might eventually just get shipped over on tree material. But um, the misnomer is it only attack ash trees. Yes, it, it prefers, you know, ash trees, green ash trees. But the thing is, is they've already done the research and found out that it'll also attack our olives. Um, and so keep in mind in California, it could have a slightly more uh, diverse palette than just ash trees. Um, so keep an eye out for this guy. He's a flathead borer, so he'll have that D-shaped exit hole on the tree. But the main thing you'll notice is the trees like to do what we call a double canopy. The original canopy is up here, and once this beetle gets in and compromises the vascular tissue, the tree will kind of do epicormic sprouting and create a secondary canopy below that. That's a great indicator for this pest. If you see that, get up close, do some searching, see if you find that D-shaped exit hole, it could be this beetle. And then last but not least, it's not a beetle. <laughs> I know, couldn't help it. I threw it in just because it's really pertaining to us right now. Uh, if you haven't had heard of the spotted lanternfly, Google it, you'll find out about it. It's been mainly on the East Coast. It's quite a devastating pest. Um, and it just showed up in uh, Davis, California. So it doesn't seem to be infesting at this point in time, but they did find a live specimen. And since this one has the ability to, you know, reproduce at like 150 at a time, even if one reproduces, we could have problems. So look for any sort of these masses, egg masses on trees. Um, it's kind of distinct, not like anything else we have here. So if it kind of looks pink and fuzzy, get up close, take a look, take a sample, let someone know. The moth itself has the kind of outer wings that are spotted or speckled. But once they open up, it's distinctly red on so in the inside. It's very unique. And then if you happen to see one of the creepy kind of instar states, <laughs> that'll definitely catch your attention. Uh, so really pleased if you happen to see this anywhere or suspect you see this anywhere, let someone know, uh, County Ag, myself, someone, uh, any PCA rep, we're happy to help you identify if this could be the pest or not. This one will be detrimental to our ag industry. 
uh, it will actually get into our grapes and our almonds and our apples. So we, we're desperately tracking this one. So if you see anything, please, please say something on that one. So that's kind of my presentation on uh, our beals. I have some resources here that I kind of put up here if you guys want to take a screenshot of this. Um, there's just some additional websites that can help you identify more of the beetles, which ones are truly, fat, you know, foes, which ones we kind of ignore. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free, let me know. And that is my presentation for today. I, I hope you guys learned at least one thing new.